Welcome to Do's and Donuts. We're here with John Detweiler, the farm manager at Venture Heritage Farms, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, how to create permanent raised beds. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about, uh, this is not my area of expertise, so I'm more in the tooling and equipment side of it, but yeah. uh, uh, we do have customers that deal with uh, permanent raised beds, and, and I know that's something you really enjoy, so uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so we've been growing produce here on the farm for a couple years now, and I really got excited about the idea of of the soil quality and what it takes to really bring the soil to life, reduce weed pressure. And I stumbled across some videos and talked to some people about no, no dig, no till um, bed systems. And uh, we, two, uh, three years ago now, we set up our 0.3 acre no dig bed system. And so I'm happy to kind of talk about that and uh, Lots of do's and lots of don'ts. Uh, we get a, so so we what is it? So uh, if you had to define a, 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 a raised permanent bed, what, what, how would you define that for somebody? Yeah, so I would say a, a no-dig, no-till system would be vegetable production without the use of tillage or basically soil inversion um, to bed prep, to clean the fields. And so all of your beds are set up at a specific width with a specific aisle. You set it up once and that's it. Then you farm that system from that point on. So I would say the number one do is get a soil test. I'm sure that's the number one in all scenarios, but you have to know what's in your soil. You have to correct mineral problems, um, calcium, pH, do that all at the beginning because one of the problems with no-dig systems is once it's set up, it's set up. You're not going to change the row width the next year, and um, a lot of the fertility that you want to put in should be done at the beginning, especially so you're starting off on the right foot. Yeah. And are you, so <clears throat> you're heavily laying compost, and, and you're layering compost, right, to build that up? Right, so you set up, it kind of depends. It depends on the scale of your farm, how big you are, the time frame, when are you setting up these beds, what time of the year, and also what tools do you have available. Um, I, I think a lot of people are very purist about not disturbing the soil, but in, in my experience, you want to find as much carbon as you possibly can, well, like leaves are ideal, and cover your space ahead of time. And, and I think you need to turn that carbon in. And uh, a lot of people like to just layer um, this compost and wood chips, but it's you know, getting your soil test and then setting up your beds the width you want and getting, getting a lot of carbon in there right away is really important. Because what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for the long term. And uh, a lot of the stuff you do at once, and if you try to adjust things later, it's much more difficult. So you're getting your soil tests, and what else are you going to do before you, you start? Uh, uh, obviously, I think I heard you say earlier about uh, needing to till, right? <laughs> right. So yeah, I know it. Um, I'm not. I'm not dogmatic about it. I, I think you're laying a foundation at the beginning that is going to assist you throughout the life of your beds. I I've noticed that often compost layers and the soil layers don't interact as much as you might think. Uh, you would think that the worms and the the frost heaving in the winter and just microbial life would really blend them. But I, I think you need to get that carbon into the soil, mixed into the soil. And also that will give you a, a much better seed bed to um, set off your rows and get, get things going. Now, if you, if you don't want to do any tillage, I would really recommend when you set up your, if you wanna just go straight from a lawn to a garden, I would really recommend doing some broad forking or something to get that soil worked up. Lay compost in the row, do some broad forking so it really gets down in the soil. So you're, you're I think you, did you have some uh, permanent kind of beds uh, in the larger field area too that, that you had, that you had grass or some sort of cover yeah. um, planted in there? So in yeah. the, the small area, you've got wood chips or compost or something in right. your aisles, right? Right. So we, we tried a living mulch system where the aisle is wider and is we had like a, a 
perennial ryegrass clover mix. And I really like that, but the edge of bed maintenance is kind of tough to keep these you know, creeping grasses and clovers out of your beds. It, uh, it takes the maintenance, and then you're also having to mow regularly the aisles. And so I think we, we mostly opted for a deep compost layer, wood chip aisle, compost bed for the entire, the entire space. Okay. And that's on the smaller space then. Yeah. And, that, and that's it, worked really well for right. you. And it's, you know, you have to make a lot of decisions at the beginning. How wide do you want your rows to be? How wide do you want your aisles? We went with like a, the standard is 30 inches, but we went more with like a 34 inch bed so we could get a third row in of some crops. And we went with an 18 inch aisle. But I think 18 inch aisles is just a little too narrow. I mean, it's, it's big enough to be able to walk through, but if you have some leafy plants like broccoli and kale, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it almost covers the row, the aisle in when you're trying to maneuver around. So don't, don't plant, don't get your, make your aisles too close. Yeah, because you, because <laughs> there's that temptation to try to squeeze a couple more beds into your space. And that can end up being a little bit more frustrating, unless you're doing mainly baby lettuces and spinach and stuff like that. If you're doing kind of micro scale intensive um, crops like that, maybe it's not as big of a deal, but if you have peppers and broccoli and kale and some of these other, because we, we did a CSA, so we have, we run the whole gamut of different crops. And so it's, I, I kind of wish we would have made our aisles a little bit bigger, wider. So uh, you mentioned broad forking. Um, Talk a little bit about, I think you talked a little bit just before we were, we started this uh, about, you know, appropriate tooling right. um, and scale, I guess. Right. Right. So um, our piece is about a third of an acre. Once you get up to a half acre, there's a lot to manage on a hand scale with, you know, a, a raised bed set up like this. And I've been thinking actually recently about setting up beds to a tractor tire width. So we have a Tillmore tractor here that we use for various things. And um, we've come up with uh, a ripper shank that's three shanks wide that is just, you know, one in the center and then the two that are just inside of the bed edge. And in 10 seconds, I can do, a fi I can rip a 50 foot bed where it would have taken me, you know, 10 minutes. 15 minutes to broad fork that space. And so I'm thinking about setting up beds on a tractor tire with, um, with the potential to also be able to mow down crops. Because one of the problems with um, you know, these, these beds is that sometimes it's hard to flip the beds. If you have, you know, I mean, even green bean, rows of green beans can be kind of tough to deal with. You have to have basically a weed trimmer with a steel blade on it. That's about, unless you have a BCS or something like, like that. Um, bed flipping can be kind of tough. And so I'm thinking about ways, can, a, can a, a bed system like this be scaled up or is it basically reduced to being a micro scale hand tool sort of system? But I, I mean, I, I like it a lot and I would love to be able to scale it up more, but I think a, a tractor is gonna have to be a, a part of that or a lot, lots of help. So, um, not, not so much do's and don'ts, but kind of pros and cons that you see. You kind of already hit them, but, yeah. you know, if there's a couple, you know, bullet pros and cons of, of this type of system for somebody, what, what would those kind of top ones be? The number one con for this kind of system is the upfront time and energy that it takes to set it up. I mean, it took us a lot of days of shoveling wheelbarrowing and uh, just lots of time. And it's, it's backbreaking work too. Unless you, you know, if you use a tractor scale, you could straddle the beds with a, a trailer or something and scoop the compost onto the beds. But we use all wheelbarrows and shovels and it took a huge amount of time. And it's a lot of upfront compost expense too to get, I mean, a lot of guys are using four or five inches of compost, which I'm a little bit concerned about using that much because you can really apl over apply your macronutrients. 
And I, we're having some P and K issues with just the volume of compost that we've used. So um, one thing that, if you have access to it, we have a really great source of leaf humus, leaf mold, leaf compost, really well broken down leaves that have a lot less nutrient um, density to them, you know, a lot of carbon, but um, it, it's better for like carrot germination. When you're direct seeding into compost, you can really have a lot of trouble with uh, germination issues. And I noticed that specifically a lot on carrots, um, bunching onions, you need to be careful. And if you can have a higher carbon source, your plants will do better as far as direct seeding goes. Now the farm here is uh, certified organic. Is there any, um, is there any challenges as you talk with different like leaf humus and different uh, wood chips that you got to keep in mind in that context? Yeah, there are several. Um, our supplier, his leaves are considered appropriate for organic use. They just pile huge amounts of municipal leaves and then have a windrow turner, basically like a composting, industrial composting system. So it really is only leaves, and so therefore it's, we can use them. Wood chips, um, your certifier is gonna wanna know that there's no treated wood. I don't know what situation there would be where people are chipping treated wood, uh, but no treated wood, um, no no sawdust from wood that's been glued. So there are some restrictions in organic production. Now, I also know this is a whole different topic, but uh, you, you love compost and you, I mean, you do a lot of your own compost, uh, composting yeah. here. Um, so in, in your situation, a lot of the stuff that you apply is stuff that you're also yeah. turning and mixing and, right. and doing as well. Um, yeah, some of that is nutrient cycling. It's because we have beef cows here too. So it's nice to be able to keep that loop on farm. But also I, I got um, compost from a couple different places. And one time I found like a hypodermic needle in it <laughs> and just like trash. And it's, it's really nice for me to know that like our, our cows are not certified organic, but they graze on our organic pastures and eat our organic hay. And I know every input into the manure that's in our compost. And so a lot of these companies are just getting it from any kind of stockyard, any place. I mean, the straw could have glyphosate applied as a desiccant on it, and then you're using it in your system. So I like to know all of the ingredients in my compost. It's extra time and work, but with beef cows and a bobcat, you can make a lot of your own compost. Is there anything else that you can think of um, for maybe someone starting out new in this, uh, trying to do this type of application? Uh, what, uh, any, any advice or any, any, you kind of hit some good things yeah. already. Is there, what would you say to, uh, yeah. to finish up with? One thing that I would recommend people do is not be hurried about their operation. No, a lot of people, <clears throat> they get a piece of land or, build a house and they want to get their bed set up and going right away, which if you need to, that's fine. But I would really recommend setting up your beds like at the end of August or like late summer, early fall, get everything done, get your bed set up and just plant a cover crop in it. Just like let something get growing, get roots down in, make sure like if, if there's any nitrogen tie up, you can know ahead of time, add blood meal and things like that. Cause if you add, a lot of carbon into your soil, you can have issues where your nitrogen is taken up, breaking that stuff down. And then like a crop of spinach or something will just not, not be able to make it. So if you need to add extra nitrogen, and it's just good to let your soil break down, the microbes get going. And I mean, putting a peas and oats cover crop in your beds in the fall is one of the best things you can do for it. So if you can start them in the fall, I know a lot of people in the spring, you want to get going, want to get them started, want to get planted, want to get paid. But if you can really do it ahead of time, months in advance, let the carbon break down, I think you'll be much better off. And also that cover crop will help compete with any of the weeds at the very beginning. Because you'll have more weeds in the, at the very beginning than you will later on, the years to follow. So. And I think that's good. That that's that's good instruction. I mean, we give that similar kind of instruction for people, regardless of what system you're doing. You know, that planning ahead. You're, you're focusing on the nutrient aspect of it, but yeah. 
a lot of it for us too is managing so you know you can, like, just because you can plant that much space doesn't mean you should in your first year, right? Yeah. Like, like, it's a lot of work. I mean, at, at 0.3 acres there, that's a lot of work. Right, right. and it, it really does pay off in the long haul. I mean, we had three inches of rain yesterday and there's not a single puddle in the whole place. It just, that volume of carbon just soaks water in so well. And I, in the spring too, when you, have a, when you have beds set up like that, I don't have to wait for anything to dry out. I can plant whatever I want, whenever I want, because the soil is just so loamy and loose that, I mean, I can, I can plant onions next week and I, I don't have to wait for soil to dry out. I mean, our soil is pretty heavy clay, but with that set up, there's so much carbon, it's just, you can go whenever you're, whenever you're ready. So that's <laughs> really great too. Well, good. I, I, that, I, that's, it was good for me to hear a lot of that information. I uh, appreciate your, your time and expertise on that. And, and there's uh, a lot of great people on YouTube too yeah. that, that can give you more instruction. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of good information out there. And, and, uh, and I, think, I think really, yeah, from our, our end, obviously we're into tooling and equipment that may or may not help in this type of application much, but uh, uh, it's still knowing what the opportunities and options are out there, I think, for, for you at your scale is really important. And yeah, so, we use a lot of hand tools, too. Yeah. I mean, we're tying weeding and flame weeding and uh, different kinds of hose and uh, bed, bed shaping, prepping, rolling. So there's, there's some tools, too. Well, good. Thanks, John. And uh, now we get to go to the, the fun part of, uh, of uh, getting to eat some donuts. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, Michael's so, Bakery, Orville, Ohio. Yes, so, so I asked John, I, I, you know, we're, we're local here to each other, and so I said, hey, what, what's the, what is your favorite donuts in the area? And so he said Michael's Bakery, which is uh, not far from us here. So um, now I made the mistake. So if we open this up here, John, you want to take that one there? I think that one's yours. Is this the? I think so. So, so John told me his favorite thing was was Long John's, mm -hmm. okay? Now, another guy in our office, that's what he called it too. He's from uh, Illinois, I think. And, and I was under the impression that a Long John was, was essentially a cream stick. It was just more of a midwest, it was a different way of saying cream stick. That is not the case, as John uh, educated me this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the difference between a Long John and a cream stick? A Long John is not filled. It is, a un, it is a cream stick without any sort of filling whatsoever. So, yeah, the cream stick has, has the regular cream in here. And I, you know, I think this is going to be an education to uh, Doug, our mm -hmm. service manager at work, because he, he made me think it was just like this. So Yeah, the cream can be a little nauseating. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm not as big on, ideal. I'm not as big on, on, on cream sticks like this. I, I've already mentioned I like the, uh, the varying cream ones. Um, so I'm going to actually go for the cake donuts because uh, these are delicious. But Yeah, I agree. They just do everything well. John likes all of Michael's Bakery's donuts and them. Mm -hmm. Next time I'm going to have to try a Long John. But uh, I mean, it's just, just a donut, right? Yeah. But, but No, it's different because it's it's not a circle. There's a difference in, <laughs> in texture. <laughs> it's different because it's not a circle. Mm -hmm. You heard it here first, guys. <laughs> um, all right. I'm, what's your rating on that? It's great. I mean, maple is my favorite, but chocolate's great, too. Out of 10? Maple gets you 10? Yeah, yeah. Chocolate, maybe a 9. And Michael's, specifically. And Michael's, specifically. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, and supposedly you said most donut places don't realize the difference between a Long John anyway. That's what I've no, that's what I felt. So they Michael don't. supposedly has a rack for just Long Johns and cream sticks separately. So good job, Michael's. Yeah. Um, as a cake donut, this is a this is a good cake donut. Um, mm. I'm gonna go a nine out of ten. These are delicious. Mm -hmm. But other than that. I'm gonna try a long john next time. Yep, I Here. ate the only one. It, yeah, you got the only one. So, thanks for watching, guys. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Uh, we'd be happy to respond, and John can connect as well. Um, 
And yeah, hopefully you learned a little something about uh, making permanent raised beds. Thanks. Cheers. Ooh, my teeth were almost to the point of chattering.